Put as simply as possible, Pyre is weird fantasy basketball. It's one half sports game and one half visual novel, but where Pyre really excels is in how it manages to marry what would otherwise be two very disparate ideas in a very thought provoking way. The following video is going to spoil pretty much all of Pyre, so if that's an issue for you, here's your chance to leave, go play Pyre, and then come back. Alright, see you in 10 hours. Now, for people who haven't played Pyre, seriously, do it, it's pretty good. The game centres around you and your group of exiles trapped in what's called the downside. You've got to play weird fantasy basketball, otherwise known as rights, in order to get a chance at escaping. The Nightwings, that's your team, are the team against which all other teams are judged, so you always get to participate in the Liberation Rites. The winner of the Liberation Rites gets to send one person home, absolved of their crimes, and they're gone for good. That's the basic premise at least. In between rites, you'll get to know more about the characters you're journeying with, from Tizo, the adorable yet highly intelligent imp, to Rookie, the streetwise rascal with the soft side. This presents two very different ways of getting attached to characters that appeals to different kinds of people. The more story inclined will get to know characters in the dialogue segments and use their favourites in their rights to help fix their problems and to earn their trust. The more mechanics focused will pick the best characters for their strategy, which leads to those characters getting more dialogue and more story moments, your choices in which affect their stats, abilities and availability, engaging you with their story because of its mechanical effects. Story and mechanics are deeply interwoven in Pyre, and this is something that games critics often call ludo-narrativity. Ludo from ludology, the study of games, and narratives, meaning stories. A good way of looking at this ludonarrativity is through the lens of Richard Bartle's taxonomy of player types. Bartle says the game has fallen into one of four broad categories. These groups are Killers People who like competition, freedom from conventional narratives, and destruction. These guys are going to like the power to choose who to set free, and the rush of really sticking it to the exiles who deserve it. Like the hilarious Sir Deluge. Socializers these are people who like experiencing stories, characters, and working as a team to achieve goals. These guys like interacting with and getting to know their favourite characters, both in and outside of the rites, and will be especially engaged with the choice of who to keep around. Explorers. That's me, by the way. People who like uncovering details and exploring the fullest extent of systems. These guys will be interested in unlocking the interwoven systems of the plot, mechanics, and the characters, and might develop grander overarching goals to pursue once these systems are understood. And finally, Achievers. These are people who like being the best and completing challenges. In their quest to be the best, achievers will have to weigh up the potential costs of losing valuable assets in the form of characters with getting the best ending for the characters they care about. These groups are pretty simplistic, but they're a great way of showing how Pyre manages to take a variety of attitudes to play and get them all invested in the liberation rights. This is great, because there's a variety of angles your decision making takes. Getting rid of a character means you'll miss their strategic contribution to the rights, as well as to the social team dynamic back in the dialogue segments. For whatever reason you're attached to a character, you'll have to confront that attachment come liberation time. Overall, you have seven chances to liberate someone, so even if you win every match, you'll still be leaving three members behind, yourself included. One of the characters I saved from near the end was one of my favourites, Sir Gilman, who put himself in self-imposed exile until he had regained his honour. Only after he'd helped set his newfound allies free and made peace with his past, thereby completing his quest, did I let him go. Now, the outcome almost certainly would have been the same if I'd just let him go immediately, but it speaks volumes to Pyre's writing that it was able to make me care about a character enough to get me to spend valuable time seeing his story through. A story I only found out about, of course, because his leap ability was a bit overpowered, getting me to use him more, introducing me to his backstory. Why was Sir Gilman one of my favourites? Well, that's because I didn't have a choice but to love the guy. That sounds like empty rhetoric, but Pi does something really quite interesting in how it handles choice. It subtly forces you to make one. Even when doing things as mundane as choosing a route to travel to your destination, your options are always attached to a character, and they'll give you a bit of accompanying banter when you pick them. Same with who to field in a right. Even in the most inconsequential of matches, there'll always be a bit of dialogue from your chosen players that fleshes them out a bit more. Whatever the scenario, Pyre never really presents a neutral option. In most games where the option to stay silent or stick to the shadows is presented, it's an easy way of backing out and letting the game do the legwork, or saying you'll get around to it later. In Pyre though, even the rare option to remain silent is framed as letting a companion continue to speak, or to give them some space. In Pyre, inaction is an action. This philosophy extends to the rights themselves, which are never as simple as win or lose, they're complicated by several factors, most notably by the plan. The plan is something that one of your companions, Volfred, comes up with, 
to essentially stage a rebellion led by ex-outcasts in the totalitarian commonwealth that sent them to the downside in the first place. To progress it, you've got to send your teammates home, each of whom commits more or less to the planned success. But that's not all. You've also got to consider the casts of the enemy teams, who often make a compelling case for being let go in your stead. There's this old dogman, Dalbert, who was sent to the downside for observing a cultural festival banned by the Commonwealth, and his adoptive son followed not long after. In Pyre, you can lose every right and still beat the game. In fact, you're often encouraged to deliberately throw a liberation right and let your opponents go free, and quite a few of these force you to make these kinds of tough calls. My match against Dalbert was particularly challenging. Not in a gameplay sense, Pyre is actually pretty easy, but Dalbert and the team he led presented a legitimate case for being more deserving of redemption. This conflicted with my attitude of making sure the rebellion succeeded, sending home only my allies who I trusted to help it. I only started to consider their personal reasons for wanting to leave when I found that I only had limited chances to set them free. Ultimately I chose to beat his team, the Fates, but not without some serious reservations. I thought that would be it, and was a bit pleased with myself that my aim to only save people who would fix the Commonwealth was still going strong until the final narrative choice of the game, which managed to make me break that streak. For clarity's sake, here's the background to the choice. I had three team members remaining, the three I thought least deserving of a trip back to the Commonwealth. Adorable Tizo the Imp, who was a downside native and seemed pretty happy there, Pamatha the Harp, who wasn't loyal to the plan or to the team, but to her sister, who pretty much wanted to murder everyone I was trying to save from the corrupt commonwealth. Finally, there was Volfred, the guy who came up with the plan in the first place. I kept him around because he was easily the weakest character in the actual rights, and made any liberation right he was in harder, but also because he was generally pretty sketchy and I didn't want him to pull the whole well-intentioned rebellion into charismatic dictator switcheroo while I wasn't there to stop him. Against us in the final right was an old teammate of Volfred's, Oralag, who, owing to a twist of fate, was denied passage back into the Commonwealth and had become twisted into a monster by his own anger and the downside itself. So, after beating his team, I was faced with three choices of who to send home, and who to trap in the downside forever. Tizo, who I'd selected as the best alternative of my three remaining teammates, myself, and Oralag. I debated over this for about a quarter of an hour. I'm serious, what you're seeing right now is undoctored footage. I even drew up a pro con list, look. In the end, I chose Oralag. My whole plan was to end the cycle of banishments turning people into the very monsters the Commonwealth saw them as, and what better way to symbolise my whole aim than to save Oralag. Sure, he might not be able to contribute to the rebellion very much, but me saving him and giving him the second chance he was promised is emblematic of giving the Commonwealth a better chance. To go instead of him, even though people needed a leader, would be to make the same mistakes the Commonwealth did, prioritising those on top over those who would be difficult to deal with. For my efforts, I was rewarded with what I consider to be the best ending. There was a bloodless rebellion, and all the characters I cared about got a happy ending. Even Volfred got to see his plans turn to action. Now, the reasons for my decision making are actually needlessly complex. In actuality, everyone on your team is loyal, and even if you fail to get any of your own people out of the downside, the Commonwealth still gets overthrown, though in a more bloody fashion. Pyre deserves praise not for the depth of its choices, but how it gets you invested in its world and its characters by appealing both to your mechanical and emotional sensibilities in tandem. When I saw Hedowin's little post-game blurb, I was reminded that I set him free not just by the virtue of my narrative choices, but also because I managed to pull off a clutch triple banishment combo with Judariel. Similarly, a character you don't manage to liberate remains in the downside not because you made the wrong choice, but because you weren't good enough to save them. Of course, Darren Corbett's amazing soundtrack only aids this fusion of emotion and mechanics, pushing you in the direction of Pyre's desired emotional state whenever it's needed, which is pretty much all the time. In far too many games, narrative and gameplay are entirely separate. In Wolfenstein The New Order, for example, which I've been replaying recently, you do a bit of gameplay, then do a bit of story, gameplay, story, gameplay, story, and so on. Both are fantastic on their own merits, but a lot of the time I felt like the new order was more of a movie with gameplay segments than a fully fledged interactive experience. Which sucks, because Wolfenstein's few moments where it fuses storytelling and interactivity are great, such as the tense as all hell train encounter with Frau Engel and her boy toy, which still creeps me the hell out in a way that Mass Effect Star dialogue boxes never could, by directly investing the player in the decision making process. Another game that fuses story and narrative is Near Automata in which your HUD is just a program running on your Android main character, which means you can do cool stuff like remove it entirely to free up memory for combat programs. This leads to some cool moments where the game messes with you by screwing around with your display when your character gets a virus. 
Man, I wish I could give much cooler examples, but that's a spoiler-free taster. Play Nier Automata. It's brilliant. Pyre is by no means a perfect game. The rights themselves are pretty easy to cheese, not much of the densely packed lore ends up mattering, and the choices you have aren't as impactful as you're led to believe. But what Pyre does well, it excels at. And it might be one of the best examples of a fusion of mechanics and storytelling I've seen... ever. I'm not going to forget my 10 hours with the Exiles of the Downside for a long time, and that's because Pyre, if nothing else, is great at making you care in whatever way is most meaningful to you. Hi, I'm The Architect, quickly recording this uh, right as I'm about to upload because I realised that I have, at uh, current count, 101 subscribers. Um, this is insane. What's wrong with you people? Yeah? You, you think you're funny? Ironically subscribing to me? Ironically liking my videos and providing mostly constructive criticism on my stuff? Yeah? Yeah, you think you're funny? Punk? Well, well, thanks. In all honesty, um, it, it means a lot um, to have a pretty pretty good reception to this stuff. I've never really done it before, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's there's gonna be more where this came from, more videos, more amateur critique, and hopefully I'm just gonna get better at doing this as time goes on. Um, yeah, if you've not subscribed, I guess I'll put a little button so you can subscribe in the top corner and. Uh, I mean, why, why am I saying this? I'm sure you've been to YouTube before. You know what to do. You, you know the deal. <laughs> uh, right, so I'm going to level with you. I've completely overran this. This was supposed to be about 30 seconds, and we're now running into minute-plus territory. Uh, this is why I write scripts for everything, because I'm basically incapable of talking like a normal person in most scenarios, and I get massively sidetracked all the time and end up rambling about stuff no one gives a fuck about. So I'm going to go before we hit the 12-minute mark. Have fun, subscribe, like, comment, smash that motherfucking like button, and oh my god, 12 minutes, it's gone. We've ever ran. This, this is what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Goodbye.